Okay, so we'll get started with the next lecture, which is the topic of IO models. And then again, since we are on the topic of storage systems, we are going to discuss what are the different ways that you can perform IO operations from, this is from the viewpoint of user space processes, right? Um, there are, uh, you know, various uh, uh, ways that, you know, user space processes can access files. And we know a common way, which is, you know, you, you perform a read or write operation to a file and, uh, and that read or write operation completes, you wait in the meantime, and then once the I/O operation completes, uh, your system call returns back to you. Okay, so you've been using some of these read and write operations in your um, in your assignments. Okay, so we're going to look at some of the alternatives to the standard I/O model, and and how it affects you know your design decision or or, or your system design. All right, so. Um, uh, so this has to do with the idea of concurrency. So when we talked about threads, we uh, we we came across, we discussed this notion of true concurrency and apparent concurrency. But especially when we talked about user level and kernel level threads, if you remember, going back to that, uh, there was this idea that there is true concurrency where you can have two or more processes or two or more threads running concurrently, meaning that they can be preempted at any time and they can share a CPU or they can run on two different CPUs at the same time, which is parallelism, right? So that's true concurrency because you have independent threads or independent processes being scheduled by the CPU scheduler in the OS, okay? And then there's this idea of apparent concurrency where, which is what we saw in event-driven programming. Event-driven programming, meaning that you know, you can have a single thread that's handling many events, but then it switches from one event to another, one task to another, depending on the event. So for example, you had a while loop and then if event one, then do task one, if event two, then task two and so on, okay? So, uh, so that's apparent concurrency, right? Uh, and, and the reason we are discussing this is um, it has implications on how we perform IO operations, okay? Uh, so for example, if, if in the apparent concurrency model, if one of the tasks uh, in the event-driven loop, if it performs a blocking system call or a blocking IO operation, uh, then all the subsequent tasks would be blocked, right? That's why it's called apparent concurrency. So it, you, you kind of get an illusion of concurrency only as long as uh, you know, there are no blocking system calls, but the moment any task performs a blocking system call, you don't have concurrency anymore. Okay, so uh, so we have to keep this at the back of our mind as we go through these different IO models. Okay, so we want some alternatives to the blocking IO model, uh, which is what we will be looking at in the rest of this lecture. All right. So, so again, you know, more on the topic of true concurrency. Here's an example where, you know, you can have a process that is listening for network connections. And, you know, whenever, uh, a, let's say client one contacts the initial process, then it would fork a second process, which then handles the first client. Um, then it goes back listening for more connections, right? Uh, and then, uh, this, the second client, when it's listening, uh, uh, contacts the server, then another process is forked, which then uh, handles the second client. So, uh, Shengdong uh, sent a link to everybody. I'm not sure what it is, but you know, you can, uh, that's your source code for multi process concurrency server. <laughs> okay, yeah, so if anyone is interested, you know, feel free to. Take a look at that, yeah. Um, and then likewise, but then if you want to do the same thing uh, in an apparent concurrency manner using a single event-driven loop, then uh, you would have a single server and what it's gonna do is it will use select system call, 
and it would be waiting for connections. And whenever a new connection arrives, then it would create a, a, a network socket and then it would talk over the network socket to the corresponding client. So client one, two, and three. So they are all communicating over different network sockets, but then to the same process. Whereas in the previous picture, you know, each of these clients were talking to a different process. So this was true concurrency. Whereas here there is a single process handling multiple network connections. Okay. So this is apparent concurrency. For these clients, it looks like they're, you know, concurrently being serviced by the server, but internally there's a single thread. Okay, so depending upon what you're doing with your web server, for example, uh, you could use either of these two models. If you just have a simple web server with not much of performance uh, constraint, you could use a concurrent, uh, apparent, concur apparent concurrency server that's using select system call. Whereas if you want higher performance, you can use true concurrency. Okay. So this just sets the groundwork for the different types of IO models that we're going to discuss. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, so here, uh, so we, got, we, are, we are familiar with the default IO model, which is the blocking IO model. What that, uh, and we'll see what that means in a little bit. Uh, and then there are uh, four different for additional IO models that we're going to discuss, non-blocking, IO multiplexing, signal-driven IO, and asynchronous IO. Okay, so let's get going. So before we understand these models, how they differ from each other, we have to understand how data arrives and is delivered into the system and how it is delivered to a user-level process. Okay, so most of the differences between these IO models is in terms of how read or receive operations are handled. So either you're reading data from a file or receiving data over a network connection or from, you know, a keyboard input or mouse or whatever, uh, any form of IO operation, it goes through two stages. First, so assuming that let's say data packets are arriving over the network. So here the first step would be the data would arrive over the network, it would go into a kernel buffer. So there'll be an interrupt and then the interrupt handler would uh, you know, uh, pick up the kernel buffer. The net network card would have to have done a DMA operation into a kernel buffer, and the OS would then notice, pick up that kernel buffer. And in the second step, the data in the kernel buffer would be copied into the user space of, uh, memory of a user level process. For example, if you, are, you have a user space process waiting on a network connection for data, that process will be scheduled. And when that process is scheduled at the time, the kernel would do a copy to user operation. Like you have used copy to user function in your uh, assignment too, right? So the second step is basically a copy to user operation. Okay. So the first step could happen uh, ahead of time when the process is not scheduled. But then the second step is usually done when the process is scheduled, copy to user operation. Okay. Um, so these two steps are important to understand. The first is data has to arrive into the kernel, and the second is that the data has to be copied into user space. Okay, uh, and so we, with this in mind, we're going to see how these different I/O models they differ from each other uh, in these two steps. Okay, so the very first one, the one we are familiar with, blocking I/O model. What does that mean? So from the user space application, you may do a read system call or a receive system call. And uh, at that time, the control gets transferred into the OS because it's a system call, right? And, and then the OS would check whether the data that you're requesting is available already or not. The data is not there at the time, then uh, it, it, what your process would be moved to a blocked state. So. So from user space process, it made the read or receive system call and it blocks. Uh, the application itself doesn't realize that it's blocked. When it finally returns from its system call, it has a data available, okay? And it can read the data and use it. Uh, but internally, what the OS is doing is that it would put the data, uh, put the uh, process in a blocked state from running the process is going from running to blocked state. 
and and the what what's the event that is blocked on it's blocked on the event that the data has to be ready the data has to arrive into the kernel buffer okay the step one of that uh, figure that we saw earlier um, in this picture the step one of this figure uh, that's uh, that's the event on which the process is blocked okay so once the data arrives into the kernel that's when the data is ready. So the process gets woken up, meaning that it moved from blocked state to the ready state, okay, where it can be scheduled. And, and at some point it is moved from ready state into running state, okay? So when it's moved to the running state, at that point, the kernel would copy the data from the kernel buffer into user space. Uh, so what this means is that, you know, the copy to user function uh, would be invoked. And during the time the data is being copied to user space, you know, again, the process is not executing. Okay. And uh, once the copy to data is complete, then uh, you would return back from uh, the system call back to user space. You would tell the process how many bytes you have read and the process can then use the data. Okay, so the whole point is that the two phases that we saw in the previous slide, the first phase is receiving data from the uh from the say from the io device the network card or the disk into a kernel buffer and then the second st step is copying data from the kernel buffer into the user space application okay so and during both of these phases the process is completely blocked it cannot make progress only when both steps complete then it returns back and it makes progress all right so so this is the default blocking IO model. So whenever you do perform IO operations without any special configuration, this is what you're doing. Okay. Any questions on this blocking IO model so far? Okay. So, um, so now we are going to uh, move to the, the next one, which is called non-blocking IO model. It's also called polling. Okay, so um, the name is a little bit misleading. All right, so name says non-blocking, but it's only non-blocking for one of the two steps, only for the first step. Whereas the second step of the IO operation is still blocking. Uh, but traditionally, this has been called non-blocking, and it's good enough for most purposes. Okay, so so what does this do? Um, so you, in this case, you would tell the OS ahead of time through some system call saying that I don't want my IO operation on this file descriptor to be blocking. Okay, so by doing so, uh, when you perform a read operation, the system call would transfer control to the OS. And the if the data is not yet available, in the previous case, like again, going back to the previous slide, in the previous case, the OS would have move the process to a blocked state, right? But now the OS says, it, it's gonna return back to the user space saying, I don't have the data, you know, you, your operation would have blocked, E would block is an error, would block. So you're returning back to user space saying, I don't have the data effectively. Okay, try again later, that's what it means. So, so the user space application can do, do something else that, and then it can come back again and try to attempt the same IO operation. And if the data is still not available, it would again get a E would block error. So what this means is that the process remains in the running state, right? Uh, there's a question. So it is like a busy wait. Yeah, that's right. So it's, it's a busy wait, but you, you don't have to be busy just constantly asking. It, the process could go and do something else between these read operations and then come back, okay? So it's not necessarily spinning, but it can do other things in between. It's like polling. Polling means like I periodically check with you and then I'll come back again later. Okay. Uh, does that make sense? All right. So, uh, so finally, you know, after in this case, after in the third attempt, when it makes us the system call again, now the data has arrived. So at this point, the Process still remains in the running state, but then the OS invokes copy to user to copy the data 
into the user space, into the user buffer. And once that, and during this time, when the data is being copied into the user buffer, the process is blocked. Blocked, not in the sense that it's, it's not moved to a blocked state, rather that the OS is running in that particular process or thread that made that system call is not making progress, okay? So if you have a small amount of data to copy, then this duration would be, the second step would be very small. So practically, you know, you were, the process won't notice it. But if there's a lot of data to copy, then this second step can be very large and it can significantly hinder the progress of the application, okay? Or for example, if you know, you're receiving, say, millions of packets per second over the network, uh, which means that you have to, even if you are using non-blocking IO, your first stage may not be blocking, but then the second stage, the copy to user would be invoked a million times per second, right? So that can add up, accumulate, and, and contribute to a, a lot of overhead, right? So under certain high throughput, high data intensive IO scenarios, where you're doing a lot of uh, copying large amounts of data, uh, you would end up, you know, um, uh, you may end up spending a lot of time copying the data to, to user space, okay? Um, so, uh, right, so now, so is this clear, this non-blocking IO model? Um, like we are, we are not blocking in the first phase, which is, waiting for the data to arrive, but in the second phase, uh, when we are, um, when we had to copy data to user space, then the process is, is prevented from making progress during that time, okay? All right, so Shengdong has a comment about ePoll versus ISCP. Yeah, that's where we are headed next. You know, select system call, there's now something called ePoll instead. Okay, but I'm gonna use my old slide to mention select. So next, you know, we're gonna look at, so I'm gonna come back to IO multiplexing. Let's actually go to the next one first, which is signal driven IO, okay? So, um, so, so the problem with non-blocking IO was that you had to keep checking, right? Uh, with the OS, you had to keep asking the OS, do you have my data ready? Do you have my data ready? You could keep saying, no, check back later, check back later. Okay, like you guys asked me for grades. Did you guys grade yet? Did you grade yet? And I'll say, no, check back later, check back later. <laughs> okay. So that's polling, right? And the other thing is that, you know, you just uh, say, hey, professor, you know, when you're done grading, can you send me an email? I say, sure. Yeah, so, and then when I'm done grading, I just send you an email, go check your grade, grades available, right? And then you go check your grade. So that's signal driven IO, right? So. So instead of constantly polling, you, you just tell the OS, all right, this is the data I want. When the data is ready, let me know. Okay, I'm gonna do other things. Um, so, so that's signal driven IO. So here, the way it works is that the application will establish a SIG IO signal handler, and, and it will tell the OS what data it wants. In, and, then, uh, and then the OS would take note, and if the data is not right, available right away, the OS would then set up some internal mechanisms to, uh, to trigger additional events when the data arrives, okay? In the meantime, the process goes and does other things. It doesn't check with the OS constantly like we were doing with non-blocking IO, okay? Uh, later when the data is, ar arrives, then the OS remembers, hey, this, person, this process had set up a signal-driven IO earlier so I have to send a signal to let it know that the data is here. So it will deliver a SIG IO signal. And as a result of the signal, the process, there will be a signal handler that the process had set up that would run, okay? And the signal handler runs, inside the signal handler, the process would say, hey, my data is here, let me go and read it. So now it calls a read system call, which would now transfer control to the OS, which would copy the data uh, into user space like before. When the copy is complete, you return back. So, so we again have two steps, step one and step two. In step one, the process is not blocked, but it's not constantly checking. In step two, the process is blocked. 
in the sense that it's not making progress. Uh, but, uh, and that's because data is being copied from kernel to user space, okay? So this is a slight improvement over non-blocking algorithm. Great. So uh, let's uh, next go. So now, like I mentioned earlier, that um, uh, the second phase, copy to user, uh, this, if it happens often enough, or if you're transferring large amounts of data, this can add up to overhead. And some people don't like that, right? They all even want to, the second stage to be non-blocking, which is like completely non-blocking. And that's where this asynchronous IO model comes in. What that means is that in both phases, we are not going to block the process, right? So ideally what we want is application just says AI or read. AI means asynchronous IO read. So you tell the OS what data you want, where to copy it ahead of time, and the OS would uh, take note of it and you return right away to the user space process. Process can go do whatever it wants. And finally, when the data is all copied into user space, it will get a signal and a signal handler will run which will read the data, okay? So that's what, that's the behavior we want from the process perspective. From the OS perspective, OS would internally issue the IO operation, wait for the data. When the data is ready, it would do a copying the data to user space, all right? So remember, this is happening while the process is doing other things, right? So this is happening in the background without interrupting, without blocking the process. And once the copy is complete, then you inform the process by sending a signal and, and then that signal would uh, tell the process that, hey, your data is already in your user space. You don't have to specifically read the data again through another system call and the press can just use the data. So this, is, this looks great, you know, so you don't have to block at all. And the only catch though is that the second phase, copying the data to user phase, user space, um, here you, the OS is writing data into the user space memory, the process memory, while the process is running and it's doing other things with its memory, right? And that can be dangerous unless it's done carefully. So what that means is that the, in the very beginning, the application has to set aside some memory and tell the OS here, you know, in this piece of memory, please copy your data. And, and then, you know, I'm gonna go do other things. So you have to trust the process that it's not gonna do something crazy with that piece of memory, right? You have to make sure that piece of memory is not swapped out, like it still belongs to the process. And um, it, normally the copy to user function that you've used in your assignment, that's executed in the context of the calling process, right? So the process is scheduled on the CPU and then you do a copy to user. Whereas this particular copy to user for asynchronous IO, this is being done, it's, it might be done outside of the context of the process, right? So that, that makes it harder to implement in most operating systems. So, so I do, although this is conceptually the ideal asynchronous IO model, but in practice, uh, it's very hard to realize this in most OS, at least in a safe manner. So, uh, because it requires you to trust the process. I mean, what if the process dies in between or what if the process dies while you're copying data to its memory, right? So you have to handle a lot of boundary conditions and race conditions to get it right. So it's really hard and, and the potential benefit of doing something like this is, uh, is very less, right? So you're only saving the amount of time needed to copy data to user space. So, so most OSs don't provide this as it is, this capability. They would provide you an AI or read interface, but it would usually be implemented as either a non-blocking model or as a signal-driven IO model. Uh, none of the, at least Linux, for example, does not give you a pure asynchronous IO. The system call is there, but you don't get the pure AI or behavior, right? Uh, but then, you know, you may have specialized systems for, for example, for high performance computing or supercomputing applications where you may have 
specialized operating systems that provide you this additional capability uh, because they know what they're doing in those situations. Okay, any questions so far? All right, so, and I will try to quickly give you an overview of the IO multiplexing model, which I mentioned earlier. So this is kind of a combination of these various IO models, but the only difference is that we want a single uh, process or single thread to be handling IO operations on multiple file descriptors. Okay, so here a single process is handling IO operation on FD1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And um, so, so some of these are network connections to other clients, some of them are files, F3 and F4, one of them is a pipe, all right? So, so how does this work? You know, we want to use that event-driven loop to do this, something like this. So, uh, so what the IO multiplexing model does is that uh, it would use the select system call uh, to, to tell the OS that I want to wait for IO operations on multiple file descriptors. Normally the blocking system call would wait for IO operation on a single descriptor, only one descriptor, right? Here, in the, like in the previous picture, we would wait on five descriptors. We would give the OS five descriptors and say, like, I want to wait for I read, write, or exception operations on five descriptors. So when the process is blocked, right, the, it's blocked on five events instead of just one event. So that's a big distinction from the blocking IO model that we saw earlier, okay? And then we have the read and the receive IO operation that uh, once there's data available on any of these descriptors, then the, then the select system call would return back. Uh, or if you, you can use ePoll now, which is you know, a better version of select. Um, and, and then you, know, you can, uh, from the read, at that point, the process would then invoke read or receive calls on each individual descriptor one by one. So whichever descriptor has data ready, it would invoke a read and receive. So you, in the first phase, you block on all the descriptors together. But in the second phase, you block on each descriptor one by one individually, okay? So, uh, so, this, so in conceptually, this is very similar to the blocking IO model. Only difference is that uh, the first stage has, uh, you, you block on multiple descriptors at the same time instead of doing them one by one. Okay, and that's a huge advantage uh, when you're handling multiple IO descriptors in the same thread. Okay, so any questions on this? All right, so I had mentioned that you can actually also tune the behavior of the select system call. For example, this blocking doesn't have to be unbounded blocking. Uh, in the sense that you can specify how long you want to block. For example, you can say, I want to block for like five seconds uh, before I give up. So the OS would wait for five seconds for data to be available on any descriptor. If it's not available, it will return back. And then the process, process can check back later or 10 seconds. Or you can specify zero seconds wait. What that means is that it would check with the OS if data is available on any of the multiple descriptors and return back right away. And then you can check back again. So you can change the behavior of this select or epoll system call between fully blocking to you know fully non-blocking or anything in between. So so that's very uh, very powerful system call. You can do a lot of different things with it. Okay, so I think we are out of time. So I'm going to stop here. Uh, I think the the subsequent slides have an exa example of if you want to program using even during programming using select system call, how you would go about it. So I won't go into the programming details. You can, you know, refer to the slides and 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 get an idea how you would use the select system call. Okay. All right. I think that brings us to the end of this lecture.